Well, hello and welcome uh, to today's uh, webinar. My name is Rob Cowell. I'm past president of CFST and owner of Chris Cor and Associates uh, Food Ingredient Agency. And, and on behalf of Food in Canada, Canada's only national food and beverage processing magazine, um, and CFST, I welcome you to our 2021 Table Talk uh, webinar series, The Learning Trough, where we bring you regular webinars that explore the future of food. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, Dempsey Food for their generous sponsor of our webinar series, without which uh, might not have happened. So thanks uh, again to Dempsey. Uh, today's topic is Deep Health Driving Food Choices, and our speaker is Brian Lanahan, CEO of Aquitaine Innovation Advisors. So let's learn a little bit about Brian. Uh, Brian is the author of five Amazon-published books on artificial intelligence, including the bestseller Artificial Intelligence, Foundations for Business Leaders and Consultants, and Deep Health, Using Artificial Intelligence to Live Longer and Healthier, um, and his newest release, Quantum Boost. So Brian is a, a former executive and top 10 North American uh, bank and university instructor and uh, mentors uh, innovative companies in the Halton and Hamilton areas. Uh, Brian's training in AI comes from MIT and he writes extensively on artificial intelligence and quantum computing. Now speaking of the book Deep Health, Artificial Intelligence uh, to Live Longer and Healthier, which I had the honor of co-authoring with Brian, we will be uh, drawing for a free copy uh, the book at the end of the webinar. So stay tuned and Heidi will uh, draw a name uh, and someone will win the copy of the book. So uh, now before we get into the presentation, like we've done with our other webinar uh, uh, our guests, I'm going to ask Brian an icebreaker question. So uh, Brian, as we all know, COVID-19 has been a very stressful time for a lot of, a lot of us. And my question to you is, what did you do to de-stress during this period? Um, so thank you, Rob, and, and welcome to all the participants here on the webinar today. Um, and thank you to uh, the uh, Harvester Level uh, sponsor, uh, Dempsey. Um, so during the COVID period, you know, I am a, I'm a book writer. Uh, I do a lot of consulting um, and I uh, do a lot of article writing and blogs and conferences. But I think for me, one of the key things for uh, getting through this COVID period was learning the guitar. Um, I am a big fan of the 80s group, 70s, 80s group Boston. Uh, so I'm actively learning as many Boston songs as I can. Oh, that's really interesting. Good. Good. You're going to entertain us maybe at this future webinar. You can do that. Uh, that won't happen. No. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Great. Thanks for that. Um, Good. Now, before I turn it over to Brian, I just want to mention that if you have any questions, you can write them in the question box, and I'll monitor monitor any questions as we go through. And uh, and at the end of it all, Brian will attempt to answer questions, time permitting. So, without further ado, uh, welcome Brian Linehan. Thanks, Rob. Uh, so this session is really all about how we're using artificial intelligence to drive food choices. And you'll um, what I'm hoping to do is identify what that intersection is. And maybe I can take it to a sort of a basic level. The reason why I got very much involved in this is sort of the most recent part of my personal journey. Um, back in about 2016, I was actively involved uh, working for a major bank, traveling every week, uh, being on an airline, um, having hotel food, uh, restaurant food, not exercising, um, you know, not really taking care of myself. And it became a massive health challenge for me, uh, contracting diabetes and being overweight and um, really having some, um, some breathing challenges. So all of those things led to a point where I needed to make some changes. And because of my, my technology background in the past, um, it became a very obvious marriage of how I could use technology tools to inform my choices about what I do to exercise, what food I have, um, um, and make it very personal. So not just simply a generic diet approach, but how I can use those tools just for one person, for one unique physiology, me. So before I get started, I'd really like to be asked a question if I could, those people who are on the webinar, um, tell me if you use, and just simply by a yes or no response, um, do you use a smartwatch, maybe a Fitbit, or you use your phone to monitor your health or your food activities in any way? 
So um, um, one of our facilitators is going to monitor that within the chat. And I'd very much like you to just give a yes or no answer now as I go through the presentation. So today's webinar is very much about the amount of health and nutrition data that consumers now have. It's exploded in terms of accessibility of that information. And technologies like artificial intelligence are really helping us make sense of all of that data. And we'll talk, we'll go through a little later on exactly what that kind of data is. And then consumers are there increasingly using these tools to make decisions about their food choices. And so we'll talk about what globally people are using technology tools for health and the health space. And for uh, to close out, we'll talk a little bit about the newest deep tech technology called quantum computing. And if you haven't heard about it today, I'll talk about it in a very, very high level, but just to give you a sense of where technology is going and how it's going to impact agriculture and how it's going to impact food. So let's go on. If you listen to the World Health Organization, uh, the world's biggest killers of individuals today, uh, this data is from 2019, but it continues. These are the top four. So heart disease, very much the top, um, you know, the restricted blood flow uh, with inside our physiology, uh, stroke, restricted blood flow through the brain, COPD, uh, challenges with lungs and breathing, and then finally diabetes, which has really entered into the fray uh, with a massive increase since the year 2000. None of these are communicable diseases. These are all diseases that are contributed by our activities and our course, our uh, genetics and physiology. So if I'm talking about nutrition, what are some of the key areas of focus today? Well, there's two major reasons why people are focusing on nutrition. Obviously, a growing health consciousness, the availability of information, whether it's through social media or um, celebrity or other ways. And then the rise in the increase of chronic diseases across the globe. I mentioned those four, you know, um, if 60 million people uh, a year uh, are dying in around the globe, um, uh, over 30, actually 35% is due just to those four chronic diseases. But there are major barriers to that, and those barriers are cost. So if we're just simply suggesting that people look at organic foods, uh, foods with proper uh, exciting or interesting labels, um, but they aren't attainable or accessible by the average citizen, that's a challenge to nutrition, obviously. And then, of course, false promotions where there are suggestions that this is healthy, whether it's a supplement or an organic food. Um, you know, are they truly healthy for us? And of course, the average consumer can't necessarily make that decision for themselves, but they sure do have a lot more tools to understand that as of 2021. So is this really an issue? Is this, this really an opportunity from um, uh, our AI perspective? Are people really moving into nutrition in a real meaningful way? Um, according to some, uh, like the Global Market Opportunity Analysis and Industry Forecast by Meticulous Research, they say the human nutrition market will be at 464, 465 billion within just four years. So compound annual growth rate is 6.6%. So meaningful. And so what are they doing? 54% of all those consumers and 63% over 50 are really looking at the healthfulness of their food and beverage choices. Significantly more in 2020 than in 2010. And so what were the biggest key factors for them? Healthfulness was the biggest mover. So you look at the other components, more than taste or price. So if we're talking about looking for tools that are impacting trends, we're suggesting that food choice is potentially changing. And so we need to understand how. Well, in some cases, they're eating more proteins. And those more proteins are from plant products. You've heard this many times, I'm sure, whether it's plant-based dairy or others. 
So people are looking, and this isn't the only trend. So even if it's not a plant-based alternative that people are looking for, they're looking to understand the nutritional component that is based in the food that they are choosing. So how can they use those technologies? Um, can I go back to, uh, Rob, do you have the responses to the, um, uh, to the questions? Yeah, I think uh, the first res response was, there was about, it's about 50-50, about half. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah. so what I'm gonna do is suggest to you that this group is ahead of the average in Canada, but not necessarily ahead of the leading countries in the world on that 50-50 level. So we'll talk about this. Um, so if you're thinking about, um, you know, products and services that are available in the future, this is a very material trend. And so if consumers are looking at this kind of trend, then how are they doing it? So let's give it next sort of next view. Celebrities. Uh, Tom Brady is 43 years old. He plays in a highly aggressive, uh, injury prone sport. And yet he is by far the greatest football player of all time. And in his world, he has moved from strength training and um, uh, speed to pli pliability, resiliency, longevity. And he has looked at his sort of uh, way of thinking about his life in quite different ways. And so he has developed his own method uh, called the TB12 method, but people are starting to watch this, not only athletes, but others who have bought their books and so on, because this is not necessarily about any one type of diet. Uh, people always focus on Tom's aversion for avocado ice cream, but this is much more than that. This is about water consumption. This is about, you know, the types of food that you're eating. And there are ways for uh, individuals to track that on an ongoing basis to make sure it's working for them, not just for Tom Brady, because he says it works. But here's a 43, almost 44 year old individual in one of the most aggressive games in the world who is thriving and continuing to win and continuing to stay uninjured. Um, so it's a fascinating way that people are starting to pick up on celebrities who are focusing on longevity. When back in 2018, uh, Rob and I started talking about what this intersection of my world, which was technology and artificial intelligence, and his world of nutrition started to see an intersection. And that was the basis for this book, Deep Health. And so we came up with Deep, we um, launched Deep Health in 2019. And what we were trying to do was help people to understand how artificial intelligence could, could help them make better choices. But not just better choices in general, better choices about them specifically and individually. What's my physiology? What is my genetic makeup? What is my pH balance? What does my microbiome look like? It's unique. So how can I feed that to optimize myself? And those kind of insights. So not only, and of course, not only food, but your sleep patterns. Every morning I know I wake up and I check the percentage of my REM sleep and deep sleep and my active, my awake time and light sleep. And not because I'm a metrics hound, because I like to know what contributes to a good night's sleep. So how can I get that really good solid seven, eight hours and two to three hours of REM and deep sleep because it's detoxifying my mind. And again, this is not about bulking up on tons of metrics. This is about giving people the opportunity to choose which areas they want to focus on, whether with their medical health practitioner or not. Um, certainly the last 18 months has been presenting us with big challenges in terms of immunity, um, comorbidities creating large challenges on the COVID front, but those people who are exercising regularly, eating properly, you know, simply reducing that risk. And what our topic is about today, food consumption. So 
with a uh, number of people responding here saying, yes, they do use um, smartwatches or Fitbits or whatever. There are so many different tools. One of the tools that you'll see in the top of the screen, which uh, has a, is a scale, uh, it identifies itself as eTech City. And uh, I know both Rob and I use a scale that's similar to this, but it's not just providing you with your weight. It actually provides you with information as you step on the scale with a bare foot, um, it provides by sending electrical pulses through your feet the information around your um, um, visceral fat, your body fat level, your BMI, um, your water levels, and so on. And what's interesting is it's incredibly accurate um, as you track it over time. So simply by standing on the scales, you're gathering a great deal of data and being able to um, move your um, uh, behavior over time. What I've found is I continue to plateau on a reducing scale. Four years ago, I weighed 30 pounds more than I do today. Um, I'm thrilled about the opportunity to continue to plateau down at a reasonable level uh, because of physical activity and certainly the food choices that I'm making, but it's doing it in an informed level. So, um, um, one of the examples in the middle is a whole series of metrics. So I particularly use Samsung Health and uh, Rob uses all of the Apple uh, products. So we're able to compare notes in terms of what new capabilities are coming out on a regular basis from these different types of technologies. And so we're always looking at, you know, what new data is available. And again, yes, because we wrote a book on the subject, but also because we're very interested in our own and our family's physiologies and what they can do to, and to benefit themselves and if they choose, optimize themselves. Um, I'm gonna talk about some of the other apps down below. But how are we talking about human nutrition? nutrition? Well, we're talking about it various different ways. So whether it's by type, you know, the types of vitamins that you're taking, probiotics, proteins, you know, or carbs, fatty acids, minerals. So we're looking at how you can gain that information in other ways, like by whether it's pediatric or geriatric or maternal or you're a high performance athlete. The types of data that you're collecting through artificial intelligence um, are different and maybe the extent to which you uh, analyze them are different. One of the people we talked about in our book um, is a young doctor, PhD scientist, um, who's involved with um, uh, chemical research around immunology, and she happens to be a boxer. And so that combination, she's aware of what impacts her body, she has ways to collect that information through brand new AI capabilities, machines that are available to her that collect data about her while she's doing that exercise. So she can then optimize her performance so that she can even enjoy the, the uh, athletic pursuit that much more. Certainly by age group, whether it's childhoods or adults um, or seniors, you know, our physiology changes over time and having the ability in a very comfortable way. So looking at a uh, screen that has a user interface that is comfortable to look at, uh, that is simple. Um, it has moved a great deal over time. Um, one of the things that Apple does very well is it gives you a graphic that shows a circle. And as you are doing more activity or eating the right foods or achieving the right metrics, the circle closes. And you do that on a daily basis. So people looking at whether their carb count or something else have a very simple way. And all of that is on the basis of artificial intelligence, which is simply taking large amounts of data as its fuel and using algorithms to do the calculation and the analysis and the summary. So very interesting capabilities and not to forget about things like, you know, dietary uh, approaches and functional nutrition and medical nutrition and infants and, you know, certainly food and beverage. So different ways that individuals can look at nutrition and no longer in a way that it is so overwhelming that they can't um, complete that picture if they want to, or if they want to stay very focused on one activity at a time. Uh, and continue to improve. 
One of the things that we learned about very early in our work on writing deep health was around the difference between chronological age and biological age. Chronological age, obviously the number of years since you were born. Biological age is a calculation based on these 50 factors. And it determines you know, um, what age your body is at physically as it relates to um, all the things like not only your chronological age, but your height, your weight, blood pressure, your cholesterol, how much you sleep, uh, what stress levels you have, um, whether you have social partnerships or isolation, um, what do you have diabetes, do you smoke, do you use tobacco? But the question is, can you use all 50 factors to incorporate that into a calculation of your biological age? And uh, I know uh, I've taken several of these different kinds of tests, and I know my biological age, four years after all of the effort, is probably about 10 years less than my actual chronological age. Whereas back in 2016, I would have suggested to you it was five to eight years more than my chronological age. So again, there's so much information that's available to individuals to understand the moment themselves on a very unique personal basis than has ever been available to them before. So are people really using these personal health apps to make their choices? Well, let's take a look at these various different countries. And this information comes from Statista as of 2020. People on this call suggested that um, there was about a 50-50 response rate in terms of using smartwatches and, and Fitbits. If you take the middle of the uh, chart, you see Canada at around 37% of health app users are in Canada. In, in Canada, 37% of the population use health apps. But yet look at China and India. 65 and 63% of their population are actively using health apps. And it's a very interesting number in terms of, you know, these two countries, they have a high level of um, adoption of uh, smartphone capabilities, um, and they're choosing to use that for their health. Um, interestingly, uh, further down, um, you're talking about a third of each of Sweden, Germany, Netherlands, France, using health apps. So lots of opportunity for individuals in these other countries to reach the same levels as China and India. But what are they looking for? They are looking for a wide variety of things. So this represents the number of downloads in thousands, and this is just as of 2020. People are using smartphones to meditate, to help them sleep, to help them relax, to help them de-stress. This application called Calm, which you can get on Google, uh, Google Play, um, 244,000 downloads. Headspace, again, for meditation and sleep. Certainly Fitbit is a well-known um, uh, application. Um, Planet Fitness, similarly for workouts. One of the things we haven't talked about is um, fasting and how you go about doing it. So um, Rob introduced me to an app called Zero, which I'll talk a little bit more about, but the idea here is that you can monitor your fasting. So whether that's a 13 or 16 or 18 hour fast, and whenever you're fasting, it actually releases toxins from your body. It stops simply focusing on the sugars and starts to break down the fats in your body, um, gives you the body the chance to regenerate without having to focus on consuming more food. So um, very interesting that an application around not eating is so popular. Um, certainly, uh, if you look farther down, something called My Fitness Pal or calorie counters have become increasingly um, uh, popular. Certainly, the Noom application, widely um, advertised on traditional and traditional media like television and social media. So, um, when we look at uh, calorie counters. Um, I'll give you some very specific applications following in the next slide, but it's critical to understand why people are doing this. Um, if you're thinking about 
the average calorie count that someone consumes in a given day in North America versus some other country, you know, whether it's 2,000, depending upon your body height, size, et cetera, or 1,500 calories, you know, can you accurately measure that um, without going through some, you know, very detailed food logs, calculations, and so on? Um, so very important for people to identify their calorie intake and their calorie output. Um, you know, Rob is an avid cyclist. He will do, you know, 40, 50 kilometers on a given ride and uh, expel, you know, hundreds if not thousands of calories within that time period. So his calorie intake to replace that becomes much more, um, much greater. So, you know, important for people to take a look at their calorie counts as well. some very specific apps that are AI powered. And so again, this is not simply being digital. This is taking vast amounts of information, um, generic information from all of the other users and providing that as a comparison, but also taking the information that you're entering, whether it's by using your smartwatch or by using some sort of um, sensor, um, uh, or the motion that you're you're involved in and collecting that data about you. So let's take some examples specific to food. To measure your food selection's nutritional value, obviously consumers can start to scan the nutrition label um, using an application instead of simply manually entering into that uh, uh, into into any application or a food log uh, to incorporate that into your food decision making process. So by simply you know, moving your phone um, to scan a code, uh, very simple to gather all of that data quite quickly. And then it's not typically just one, at one food product that you're looking to scan the label on, it's several when you're out doing your groceries, so it's collecting all of that information. An application like Food Doms, where you're scanning the labels and using that data. If you're looking to collect food nutrition data from actually taking a picture of the food product itself, ignoring the, the either the nutrition label or the um, barcode, you can actually take a use your phone, take a picture of the actual food product, and get the nutritional value back through applications like Calorie Mama and Bite AI. Fascinating new developments, and it's only possible because artificial intelligence allows you to use image recognition, taking um, uh, pictures at a very fine pixelated level and then understanding what's in the picture and then comparing that to a database and coming back with a response. If you are familiar with microbiomes and understanding what your gut is telling you, there are applications for that as well. So, you know, using the capability of uh, artificial intelligence to take a, um, a, a microbiome sample um, and uh, calculating the, the health level of your own, uh, your own internal microbiome, which can be very, very important because it has such an impact on your overall body. Um, we talked about counting calories before. Yazio is yet another application that helps you to count calories. Instead of simply inputting uh, data on a spreadsheet or into a simple application, I mentioned zero before. Zero again um, allows you to um, monitor your own fasting, uh, but it also gives you comparisons of people in the general population about how they are using a fasting application. And clearly, you could tell there are plenty of those people. Um, and so, you know, using uh, an application like Zero, which appears again on your smartphone, and all of these applications can be found on your smartphone. Um, to be able to um, understand what the, uh, how long you've been fasting, um, what the benefit is of each one of those fasting periods as you compare it to other data that appears, whether it's through Samsung Health or Apple Health or you know, one of those sort of aggregate capabilities. And it doesn't stop there. It goes into the realm of recipes as well. You know, one thing that people really identified during COVID was that they, uh, many, many people love to cook. And so by going one step beyond just simply selecting food choices, 
it could actually look at personalized recipes through certain applications like pick to recipe which uh, comes from my alma mater MIT and you know it allows you to uh, take pictures of food make combinations of recipes and deliver that to you whether it's allergy friendly or a specific diet or irritable bowel syndrome or something like that that you need to understand that is specifically personalized for you and again this is just another example of how people are making food choices um, so other other uh, applications aggregate information from various different sources to help you make better nutritional decisions and they're using things like uh, data science predictive analytics uh, natural language processing which is simply analyzing vast, vast amounts of text data um, and helping you optimize your own food selections simple things like self-monitoring your eating habits using something called a smart folk fork um, which is a fork that just measures the speed at which you're consuming something. Um, uh, it's a fascinating idea, but it can also, by virtue of telling you it's red, green, uh, how fast you're eating and whether you should be slowing down. Um, gluten detectors or glucose uh, monitors that can feed into other applications. Um, and um, you know things that fit in your pocket or actually attached to your skin. Uh, Apple has said that with their uh, Apple 7 um, package, they're looking at uh, providing blood glucose um, capabilities, or so we're not sure how, but that'll be very meaningful for people who are looking at uh, monitoring their blood glucose without having to spend large dollars, um, whether it's through their health plan or otherwise. Um, so that could be a very meaningful change uh, for a lot of smart uh, users. And then, of course, what we haven't talked about before is the blood type. So individual physiologies are impacted by their blood type. So whether it's a matter of eating meat or vegetables or uh, carbohydrates and how those impact you and your blood type, since blood flow is so uh, important as it relates to all those chronic diseases we talked about at the very beginning. A lot of people these days are starting to think or have been thinking about supplements. And so there's a lot of information in the media about supplements. Um, you can go to places like Healthy Planet and get advice. Um, you can um, uh, you know, start taking supplements, uh, decide how they work for you. But there's probably a better way because if you're taking any kind of food products or medication and you're adding in supplements, how can anyone really understand all of that whole picture um, without having all the data in a digestible, understandable, analytic format? So one group, the Allen Institute, developed something called SUP AI. And what it does is it takes over 2,000 supplements, over 2,700 drugs, and identifies the interactions between these so that you can understand whether it's high risk, low risk, medium risk, and whether that your choice about taking that supplement. And so this is not just for consumers, this is available to healthcare practitioners as well. So if they're not using these tools to understand the chemical reaction uh, between medications and supplements, uh, then they're doing their patients and clinics a disservice um, because this is widely available and open source. Um, they take information from over 20 million papers uh, from the US NIH um, they list the interactions um, and they even talk about interactions between supplements, not just medications and supplements. Uh, as I mentioned, it's open source and it's free. Um, so very interesting uh, to be able to add that to the advice realm for um, uh, the um, uh, individual user who says, I may want to take supplements, whether that's vitamin C or vitamin D during a period where you want to improve your immunity or um, you want to help to have something that helps might help reduce your blood glucose or whatever those supplements might be um, to be able to understand how they're going to interact with any other medication or food products you're taking. One of the organizations that's really doing a lot of work towards moving health towards the consumer towards providing information is Sharper's Drug Mart. 
Um, in the past year, they've uh, really launched PC Health. Um, this app not only uh, provides you access to what's available in the stores, but access to registered nurses and dietitians. So um, you can actually get uh, readily available information from a recognized organization um, who can provide you with more information um, regardless of the sort of health topic. And as you combine that with your smartphone and your healthcare practitioner, you get much greater, more reliable information on which you as an individual consumer can make, whether it's health and activity choices or those food choices. One of the interesting things that um, artificial intelligence is doing, and I'm going to bring Rob in in a second here to talk about a practical application or practical instance, is around vertical farming. So challenges in Canadian seasonal agriculture, uh, any other country that has those same sort of challenges, um, let alone um, uh, environmental issues, um, whether it be storms or otherwise, um, agriculture is a very, very complex um, um, field of endeavor. What is interesting these days is how artificial intelligence is being applied to vertical farming. So whether it is cameras that are applied on the 24 seven with um, very analytical capabilities to understand exactly what's happening in the growing process, to optimize that growing process, or whether it's drones that, is going, that are um, uh, moving around um, that vertical farming environment, um, whether it's robots who are actually doing the picking uh, to make it an ultra sterile environment. Um, it's a very interesting application and it's happening more and more in various different countries. And when we talked about off the top, what's one of the barriers to healthy eating uh, and that's cost. So as these um, new vertical farms are being created, um, uh, by virtue of the you know, uh, cost of production continuing to climb, um, we're hoping that that's going to make it from vertical farm to table. Um, Rob, you had an example of that. Yeah, uh, recently there's a, there was an article about, published about uh, Bowery uh, farms who are, uh, you know, implementing AI and advanced technologies to enable more indoor farming and at a level that's eco-friendly, first of all, um, and also sustainable and scalable. And that's the key, right? Because, um, you know, it has to be scalable in order, in order to get the costs down so that, it, you know, produce, for example, is available all year round. Um, that's healthy. Um, you know, there's no use of pesticides or herbicides. Um, so much more uh, healthy. Yeah, so, you know, um, in um, traditional agriculture, um, so field-based agriculture, um, there's a lot more work being done with drones to understand water levels and uh, heat levels within the soil, um, you know, mineral levels within the soil. So there's a much greater understanding of um, the environments in which um, uh, growing is happening. Um, that can yeah. be controlled even more so in a vertical environment. Yes, excellent. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so I've just got a few more minutes um, where I'm gonna talk a little bit about a newer technology even than this. So uh, just about three weeks ago, I published a book called Quantum Boost. And Quantum Boost is about a new technology that will, um, um, work in conjunction with traditional computing. So if you think about the computer that's sitting on your desk, whether laptop or desktop, it's based on integrated circuits. And you don't really think about that too much because it just simply does its function. And when it doesn't do its function, you get it repaired. Quantum computing operates on quantum physics and quantum mechanics, and that's very interesting. But the point of all of this is that it's a brand new way that is no longer restricted to what traditional computers are, which are digital, and that's either a one or a zero. The state can only be one of those two. In quantum physics and quantum computing, it can be anything in between. And so what that does is it opens up an exponential capability that companies, organizations will, are already starting to use for uh, doing calculations, 
or optimizing things. One of the examples we use is something called the traveling salesperson problem. If a company were to send their traveling salesperson to 14 different cities in one day, if they could make that distance, a traditional computer could calculate that. If you, en if you increase that to 22 cities, it would take 20,000 years for a traditional computer to make that calculation. Yet, with a quantum computer, it can do it in a number of hours. So, the ability to take very complex problems and digest them down into a uh, quantum computing capability are on our doorstep. Now, it's a very uh, new technology and it's just being used. But companies like JP Morgan, uh, Citibank, RBC are already starting to use quantum computing for financial trading purposes. Uh, for uh, their portfolio optimizations. Cities like Singapore and London and, Is and Lisbon are already starting to use quantum computers to optimize their traffic capabilities. You can imagine the millions of different factors that go into a whole city's traffic. Well, a quantum computer is not only capable of helping you through traffic, but of organizing all the traffic for a city. So obviously, you know, better transit times may be reduced pollution as well. So from an agriculture perspective, it's a very interesting new dynamic. If you think about all the factors that go into agriculture, food science, molecular differences, combinations of foods, um, there are so many different factors. And quantum computing is going to help. One of the companies that I've identified here on this screen is called Bolts AI. It's a Canadian company. And um, their objective here is to make agricultural production more efficient. They're using big data and quantum computing. And so this is very new for um, uh, the agricultural world. Um, and it is new globally, probably maybe two years for some other organizations or other industries. But companies like Bolts AI are looking to help agricultural groups to use this new technology to more quickly understand how they can optimize their own production. So to make it more efficient, and as Rob suggests, importantly, make it scalable. So if we think about um, the opportunities of the future, certainly um, individuals are looking at um, how they can use artificial intelligence to make better food choices, but they're also going to start using quantum computing capabilities. Just this past um, uh, month, Samsung came out with a brand new phone that has something called a quantum random number generator chip. And um, what it does is it makes your um, own phone vastly more safe and secure. Um, as soon as quantum computers are in place, all traditional conventional computing security will no longer be effective. Now that could be five or six or eight years out, but it will happen. We're already starting to see it. We're already starting to see uh, companies transition to that new security capability of quantum cryptography. So it's going to happen to each of the companies that you're involved in. They will eventually transition. And if they don't, they'll be, they'll be exposing all of our data, uh, personal, uh, corporate, otherwise, to, um, to hackers uh, who have a quantum computer. So uh, very interesting times ahead. Um, and um, from a personal perspective, um, no doubt we'll start to see quantum apps uh, focusing on personalized choices for the individual around food. So, Rob, I'm going to pass it back to you um, Thanks. and uh, thank everybody for their time if they have any questions. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Uh, that was excellent. And uh, yeah, just to continue on that, that you mentioned personalized nutrition. Uh, and I think, uh, as we've talked, quantum computing is going to enable that at a, on a vast scale where it becomes scalable and affordable and, you know, able to do. And I think uh, we're going to see a, a significant change in the, in the food industry uh, from, you know, from how we develop foods at the PD level uh, right through to how we market them. And uh, it's going to change. It's not. It's no longer going to be just about putting some ingredients together. It's going to be very personalized. And there's already companies out there doing that. You know, Remedy Health was in the news recently uh, with their big, uh, one of their big investors, ADM Ventures. 
for looking at customized uh, protein bars, for example, for children and getting into more personalized nutrition. And you can imagine having a line of, let's say, gummy bears, nutritional gummy bears that are, uh, that, that they're, you're able to have, you know, an individual um, submit a request for a certain mix based on their DNA profile, for example. And, and that company will be able to deliver that kind of gummy bear at, at uh, affordable ways. And I think the only way to do that is quantum. I don't know if you have a comment on that, to add to that. Yeah, and I think to, to add on to that, people um, always talk to me about the secure the, the concern for personal security. And you know, we've talked about vast amounts of data that you can collect about yourself, um, but is there a way that you can secure it? And so it becomes increasingly important when you think about uh, capabilities like quantum to secure your phone and to have those companies secure their data. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, if, if people are going to be willing to rely on artificial intelligence and um, the data that it collects, they need to know that it's secure. And so uh, the combination of, you know, food choices, AI and quantum computing will become mm -hmm. increasingly relevant and increasingly important. Yeah. And, and you know, I think uh, one of the things we've talked about um, as well, and one of the new products and the newer products in the market is uh, a, ba a band called DNA Nudge. Um, and, you know, to me, that was one of the most fascinating things that I've seen lately where this band, you know, you take a cheek swab of your uh, and you send the swab away. They, they take a, a look at your DNA profile based on and they, they understand what uh, optimal nutrition is for you based on your DNA profile. And then you wear this band. And when you scan a, a, a food product, uh, you scan the barcodes. Um, it'll tell you, it'll flash red if it means no, it shouldn't eat it. You know, it could be something simple like gluten or something that's in it that, you, that, that your body doesn't like um, and or green and telling you, yeah, it's okay to, to, to use. And it's, it's doing quite well in the market so far. People are buying this. You're right, because this is very hyper-personalized. Right. Um, what, what's great about the approach that we take in deep health is that that's just one more piece of information. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because DNA is not a perfect science, it does add to that, you know, um, add to the overall uh, information set. Mm -hmm. But what's great about it is that we combine it with our smartwatch data, we combine it with our physical exercise data um, and our scale data and really come up with thoughtful um, solutions for us as individual consumers. Right. Yeah, good. Interesting. Okay, uh, another question here. Um, should users of these apps be concerned about sharing their data, i.e. being a product or data point for data gathering and mining? So here's a perfect example where Apple has come to the forefront. And absolutely, I think concern and awareness is very important. You know, uh, the goal of optimizing your food choices is a laudable one. Um, but where companies like Apple do a great job is that they, you know, eliminate trackers. You know, people who are using your, you know, connection to their website and, and then continuing to track you or continuing to send you um, advertisements, for example, or to use information in ways that you're, you don't accept. More and more, we're seeing cookies um, with variable selection sets. And so I know whenever I'm uh, being given the opportunity to um, uh, go to a new website, it's so important when you actually manage those selections that you don't just simply click all. You know, it's important you go in and manage and just use the basic set of cookies if that's what's important to you. Um, so, um, and then, you know, look at your phone provider uh, and understand their security capabilities. Um, so, like, we're all using smartphones to collect this data. So, it's important that we understand what our provider is doing for us. Yeah, good, good point. Um, another question here yeah, is it possible? I think we have a prize as well. Yeah, mm -hmm, exactly. Uh, another question, is it possible to get a copy of your presentation? Here's a simple one. Rob, I leave that to, um, uh, it's now in the hands of CIFSD and you're welcome to do so. Okay, good, all right. So how would you make that available? What's that? Yeah, is there any more questions? I don't see any more. No, sorry, sorry, Rob. Uh, how would you make that available? Through your website or through? Uh, yeah, I think probably through the website, but we can we can work that out and maybe uh, Constance or someone can let me know, Heidi, uh, how we might be able to do that. Okay.
Um, and let's see, uh, going through this. Oh, just a, just an update, which I thought I think you may, as more people join the webinar and answer that question that you had at the beginning about how, who uses apps, it's now 57%. So you can see the this audience is uh, far ahead of the standard, the average Canadian, uh, based on that survey you shared with us. And you know what? So I, I like that, particularly because uh, this message is um, you know meaningful to hopefully all. Um, and then for those people who are already using these applications, they found a number of new applications they can use. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Good. Uh, yeah, it is changing. There's no question. It's going to change our industry. It's going to change how we develop food and beverage products. Uh, in, 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 in the near future, I think in the next, like you mentioned, maybe five years from now, I think it's going to be quite different. Uh, time will tell. Um, you. And you know what, I think just on a comment on that, Rob, mm -hmm. uh, the key thing there is ease of use. So mm -hmm. are the people who are coming up with these wonderful applications making it easier for users to get users to gather the information? I know simply by having something on my wrist and gathering information is a very comfortable way to do it, um, mm -hmm. whether it's a DNA nudge or a smartwatch. Um, simply stepping on a scale is a momentary um, activity and gathering information. So as long as they're making it easy. Yeah, good. Um, okay, I don't see any more. Uh, let's see. Oh, well, wait, do you think, uh, oh, do you, here's another one. Um, do you think we are overutilizing our, or over rely on these AI apps and fail to make our own food choices? So I love that question. Yeah, I love that question, particularly because I love potato chips. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I will have the odd pizza Friday night. Um, and so, you know, I use it as from a balancing perspective um, that, you know, I know how much of each one of those snacks I can have mm -hmm. relative to, you know, my blood glucose level and my weight goals and all those kind of things. So I think the person makes a great point. If you're simply allowing AI to drive all of your behaviors, you know, you're sort of giving up on that individualism. So I think it's really important that people can balance it um, and understand the implications of each one of their choices. Yeah, good. Yeah, that was a good question. Thank you for that. All right. Um, I don't see any more uh, questions popping in here. So on that note, we're a little ahead of time, but that's okay. Um, uh, we're going to, we, we are going to do the draw for this. Uh, 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 the the book as I mentioned and we did that um, and Heidi has uh, put up here the winner of the book is Hisham uh, Karami so uh, congratulations Hisham and we'll uh, we'll get that out to you uh, very shortly so thanks for that um, so Brian on uh, behalf of the CFST uh, and Food in Canada magazine we thank you for your very informative presentation and and this marks the uh, the um, the, it's March our 10th and final webinar of, this, of the spring and summer series. Uh, um, thank you again to Dempsey Food for their generous sponsorship of the series. We'll be taking a summer break uh, and we'll be back again on September 8th with uh, continuing to run the webinars every Wednesday until November. So if you are a member of CFST, of course, the registration for the entire webinar series is free. And uh, again, thank you, Brian, and uh, thank you all for attending and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, everyone.